Amen. Welcome back to Heritage Baptist Church. Grab your songbook, if you would, please, and turn to page number 134. Page number 134 as we stand and sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Sing it out with me. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. When I was a seeker, I sought both night and day. I asked the Lord to help me, and he showed me the way. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. He made me a watchman upon the city wall and though i am a christian i am the least of all go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that jesus christ is born turn around and shake someone's hand this evening And as we find our seats again, page 134, if you need it, sing it out with me on the third verse. While shepherds camp their watching, or silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens, there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born On the last T'was in a humble manger That Jesus Christ was born The God of all creation Became a child that morn Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Amen. Turn over to page 143, just a few pages over to our new course of the month. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Sing it out with me on the first verse. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, good will to men. I 
thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, good will to men. And in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, good will to men. Then peal the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, good will to men. On the last, till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, good will to men. Amen. Good evening, church. Welcome to the blizzard of 2022. My goodness, how people are panicking. It's just an amazing thing. I came in about 4.30 and the roads were simply wet and I followed somebody with Florida license plate. You could tell they were having a panic attack. And uh, just uh, one of those things. Now, we are going to play a game called Musical Chairs. In a moment, I'm going to point. The ladies can play whatever song you want. When that happens, everybody's moving into this section. I don't care what your favorite seat is. Uh, I'm going to mess up your world, understand it, but we're all going to move into the middle section, okay? And we're not all going to sit in the back, okay? This just is weird for me. Uh, so ladies, just play something, musical chairs. Here we go. Everybody in the back wall, you're going to move off the back wall. Yeah. You, you got me so self-conscious that nobody wants to sit in front of me. Look at this. Even Linda moved off the very back row there. God bless you. Look at that. Did I tell you to sit down? I'm just, I'm just giving you all a hard time about everything. All right, we are here. Thank you for coming out tonight. I do realize it's snowing and uh, all of that. Uh, two people are excited, Michaela Vara and uh, Micheline Clack. They are, they are so excited that there's snow out there. Blame this on them. Uh, but certainly be praying, if you would, for the Reamers family. Uh, Brother Tim's father went home to be with the Lord uh, about 3 o'clock this morning. Uh, I think they may still be in Massachusetts, so you be praying for them. Uh, they may be coming back tonight. I don't know their plans yet, uh, but just please keep them in your prayers. Tonight, uh, be praying for Brother Jason Garner. He is coming in with his son, Luke. He is going to be preaching at our school revival this week. Uh, their plane lands at 1235, and as, right, as of right now, everything's on schedule uh, pray for Brother Tim. He is traveling to the airport tonight to get him. I guess the snow that's going there right now is supposed to end uh, about 9 o'clock. So I'm thinking I will just preach till about 9 o'clock, and uh, that will be safer when you leave. Uh, but it's, seriously, uh, be careful out there. Pray for uh, all of that, if you would, please. Uh, it's wonderful to see you tonight. Thank you for coming, snow or not. And thank you for being a good sport about moving. The people that come in late are going to wonder what on earth is going on. Uh, but we'll survive just fine. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we do love you and thank you for being our God. Thank you for meeting with us this morning. Thank you for bringing us out tonight. And I know the, uh, the snow's coming down. They're calling for a couple inches of snow before it's uh, all said and done. But keep our folks safe. A little while we'll be leaving, and we especially pray for safety in the parking lot and uh, on the roads home. Be with the Reamers family and, and bring them the comfort that only you can bring. Thank you for the promise of heaven. Thank you that Tim's dad knew the Lord and knew him well, and that is where he's at in the presence of Christ, rejoicing in a way that he's never been able to do before. 
uh, comfort his family and, and please bless them in the days to come. Many sick in our church, uh, please uh, lay your healing hand upon them. Brother Steve Malberg has been out with a migraine for weeks. And uh, Lord, that's an exhausting thing to deal with. Would you just bless him? Bless our folks that are unable to be with us tonight for one reason or another. Thank you for the live stream and the ability to do that. Would you meet with us tonight and just speak to our hearts, help us to be attentive, to listen, to learn, to grow. We'll thank you for these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. silence the deafening silence when God wasn't speaking a word all the darkness that hung like a veil a deep hopelessness covering earth till a child's cry breaks into the soul and heaven is heard once again and a star bright points to a manger in Bethlehem we're never again without hope we have a Savior we're never Go ahead and grab your songbooks one more time and turn to page number 141. And let's all stand together as we sing our last song tonight. It came upon the midnight clear, page 141.
I know there's not as many here tonight, so we have to sing out extra loud to the Lord. Sing it out with me. It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old, from angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. Peace on the earth, goodwill to men, from heaven's all gracious King. The world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing. At this time, our four through six-year-olds can be dismissed to go to their class. Four through six-year-olds dismissed as we sing the second verse. Still through the cloven skies they come with peaceful wings unfurled and still their heavenly music floats o'er all the weary world. Look now for and then lowly plains they bend on hovering wing and ever o'er its babble sounds the blessed angels sing now it's time to sing the third verse sing it out with me and ye beneath life's crushing load whose forms are bending low who toil along the climbing way with painful steps and slow look now for glad and golden hours come swiftly on the wing oh rest beside the weary road and hear the angels sing on the last verse for lo, the days are hastening on by prophet bards foretold when with the ever circling years comes round the age of gold when peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendors fling and the whole world give back the song which now the angels sing you may be seated guessing we have a special offertory tonight. Is that right? Yay, wonderful. Now you understand uh, we all have to double tithe tonight to make up for the folks who could make it, but uh, seriously, thank you for over the years being faithful in your tithes and your offerings. Uh, pray much for our missionary families over these holiday seasons. Uh, many of them are thousands of miles away from home, and uh, it's, it's going to be a difficult day for some of those folks, so be praying for them if you would. Please, Brother Stewart, come pray for the offering, please. Heavenly Father, it's, uh, it's, it's warm and fun and cozy to come into the church on a cold, blistery night. I thank you for the warmth of this sanctuary. I thank you for the spirit of the people. I thank you for the love for one another. I thank you that we can bear each other's burdens and we can rejoice when they rejoice and sorrow when they sorrow. Thank you, Father, for this family that we have. I do pray, Father, for our pastor right now as we lift him up and pray that you, as the great physician, would do something outside of medicine that only you can do from a miracle standpoint and take care of that problem that he has. I pray that each one of us would continue to pray for him on a daily basis until you come through, Father. I pray now that you bless this service. I pray that it would bring glory and honor to you. I thank you for the opportunity to give and to bring about someone, someone to come into a relationship with, with the God of the universe through the blessed gospel. Continue to bless this church, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
All right, good evening. If you would, take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, and then turn back a page. <laughs> it's, easier than saying. it's easier to say Matthew chapter 1 and then turn back a page than to say Malachi and spend 15 minutes trying to find it. We'll be in Malachi chapter 4. If you find Matthew chapter 1 and then turn back one, maybe two pages, you'll be there. Malachi chapter 4, very short chapter, six verses. We'll be reading the entire chapter tonight. If you would stand with me for the reading of God's word, I'll start in verse 1, and we'll read responsively down through verse 6. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1 says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you a lie to the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And let's pray this evening. Lord, we do love you. Lord, and thank you for the safety you gave all of us traveling. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that we have even on a day like this, Lord, where the weather is not ideal. Lord, the opportunity to gather Lord, with other Christians around your word, Lord, and sing songs that praise you. Lord, and hear preaching from your word. Lord, I pray that everything we say and do tonight would honor and glorify you. I pray for pastor as he preaches. I pray you'd fill him with your spirit, God, and I pray that each one of us would be spirit-filled listeners. Lord, I pray you'd apply your word to our heart this evening. Lord, and that we'd act on what we learn. Lord, we love you. I pray you give us safety later this evening as we drive. Lord, thank you for being so good to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I 
to cleanse my heart and set me free from sin. The Word of God made flesh to dwell among us was born to die so that I might live. Oh, I needed Him. <clears throat> Inside a humble stable, the Prince of Peace was born. Walked where angels trod, and in my heart I pondered, How can this be? He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Why did He choose me? Because I needed Him to. my heart and set me free from sin. The Word of God made flesh to dwell among us, was born to die so that I might live. Oh, I needed Him. And as the years went by, I watched him grow in grace. And as a humble lamb, I saw him take my place. He paid the price for us upon that rugged cross, cause we needed him. To Appreciate that song. If you have your Bibles open to Malachi 4, if you can keep your place there and also find Luke chapter 1, uh, Malachi 4 and Luke chapter 1. Uh, from a preacher's standpoint, a night like this, there's, all, there's a little bit of a temptation to say, we'll just cut everything uh, down just a little bit and we'll, we'll uh, you know, there aren't, a, there aren't that many people here and so forth. Uh, we'll just, we'll just kind of have a little bit of a lighter thing and so forth. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, the testimony of Charles Spurgeon as a 15-year-old boy. Uh, he was uh, making his way home one night and went by a little Baptist church and uh, saw the lights on a vicious snowstorm. We're not talking about flurries like we have right now. We're talking vicious snowstorm. 
It was so bad that the pastor of that church could not make it out that night. Uh, there was only a, a, a tiny, tiny handful of people there. One of the deacons in the church just thought he ought to do something, and so he got up. He said it, it wasn't a, a really good message, uh, and, and it, he wasn't criticizing the man. He wasn't the pastor, but he was doing his best uh, because he just felt like, well, we're here, and it, it is a Sunday night, and, and, and we, ought to, we ought to do our best for people. Had no idea that a 15-year-old boy would see the lights on in the church and would come in. Uh, had no idea that that boy's mother had been praying for him to get saved for a long time. And that night, Charles Spurgeon found the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior because the church took their responsibility seriously. And uh, that is what I intend to do tonight. I, I know the message uh, that I prepared uh, was of the Lord, and he knew what we were, the weather was going to be. He knew who was going to be here. And I realize we've got scores of folks probably watching us via the live stream but I'm not going to diminish my calling tonight by watering things down just because there's a little snow and we want to get out of here. I am going to be mindful of the time. Uh, I always say that. It, it doesn't seem to mean a thing, but I'm going to do my best on that. I want to preach a message tonight. Are we prepared for the Lord to meet with us? Are we prepared for the Lord to meet with us? As we stated this morning... When Malachi ended his, his uh, small little book of prophecy, it would be 400 years before God would speak to his people again. The final words of Malachi in, in verse 5 of chapter 4 is a promise that God gave to his people. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The Jewish people grabbed a hold of that promise. They were the last words God spoke to them, and they remembered those. During the time of Christ, they were always asking the question, they asked it of John the Baptist, are you that prophet? In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, the Bible says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, that's the New Testament form of the name Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So the people were trying to figure out who he was. Um, and, and one of those, those names that came up is, he Elijah, is he the fulfillment of Malachi chapter 4, verse number 5. In Matthew 17, his disciples ask him, saying, why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? See, they knew that before the Messiah came, Elijah had to come first. That's what the prophecy of Malachi 4 was about. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things, but I say unto you that Elias has come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. The prophecy of Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5 was a prophecy of the coming of of John the Baptist and the ministry John would have. This is confirmed in Luke chapter 1, if you can look there. We are going back to Malachi 4 in a moment. When Gabriel was speaking to Zacharias that afternoon in the holy place of the temple and spoke to him about this son uh, that, that he and his wife were going to have, verse 15, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So Zacharias got that message from the angel, and whether it, it, it uh, dawned on him or not, whether he put all the pieces of the puzzle to the, together or not, we do not know, but Gabriel said, your son is the fulfillment 
of prophecy. Your son is coming. He is the one Malachi is talking about. So John the Baptist had a very definite ministry that was prophesied and planned by Almighty God. And and if you look at the final words of verse 17 in Luke chapter 1, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That idea prepared means everything is in its proper place. The people had to be uh, in a place spiritually so that when the Lord came, they could meet with him, they could receive him, they could recognize him, they would know him. We need to ask our questions tonight, uh, ourselves a question tonight. Are we a people that are really prepared to meet with God? Are we prepared for God to do a work in our lives and in our lifetime? Uh, In order for that to be true, we need to look at this promise about John the Baptist, the ministry that God had planned for him, and, and see what needed to take place so those people would be prepared and ready for God to do a work in their lives. Go back to Malachi 4 and verse 6. There were some things that the prophet said this this, uh, 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 ministry would, would be. He shall turn the hearts, first of all, of the fathers to the children. He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. It's almost an odd statement, isn't it? As a father, nobody has ever had to tell me to make my children important. Um, most, most dads, and I realize there are deadbeat dads out there, and sadly in our culture, um, more than enough of them. Uh, we know that statistically in the inner cities uh, of our nation, uh, the, much of the trouble with gangs and drugs is completely traced back to the absence of fathers in the home. But on a, on a large scale, especially among uh, uh, God's people or people who claim to be Christians, There is a natural inclination for fathers to care for their kids, to be concerned for their kids, to worry about them. And yet the prophet said when when this uh, Elijah comes, he's going to turn the heart of the fathers to the children. Uh, What he's talking about is more than fathers who take up their responsibility of providing shelter and food and clothing and education for their children. That's important. That's a part of being a parent, part of being a father. Uh, and, And we understand that he's actually talking about fathers taking on their role as the spiritual leader in the home, pointing their children to the things of God. Brother Tim has been teaching in the book of Judges in our Sunday school class. And this morning he spent time in Judges chapter two and talked about a generation that arose. Judges 2.10, the Bible says, also all that generation were gathered to their fathers. What generation is this? Tim called them the greatest generation. These were the ones who had grown up under the leadership of Moses. Some of them actually came out of Egypt some 65 or 70 years earlier. They were small children. Uh, They were younger. um, And and they had come out of uh, Egypt. They remembered the plagues. They could remember the parting of the Red Sea. They actually ate manna for 40 years. They were at Mount Sinai and saw the mountain on fire. They heard the voice of God thundering the Ten Commandments off of that mountain in Exodus chapter 19 and 20. Um, They they saw the miracles that Moses performed, the, the water coming out of the rock, the Jordan River parting. They watched Jericho fall. Uh, They saw God give them the land in victory over enemy after enemy after enemy. This was the generation that knew God and the power of God. They outlived their parents who refused to believe God and turned back at the Jordan River uh, the very first time. Uh, But they weren't like them. They chose to trust God. And when they came to the Jordan River the second time and Joshua said, let's go forward, they said, we're with you. And uh, they weren't a perfect generation, but boy, they, they did something for God that no generation had ever done. And that's the generation that Judges 2.10 refers to, that all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. There comes a time when the oldest among us are going to pass off the scene. And we're going to hand the church over to another generation. 
We're going to hand the baton, if you will, to the next runners in the race. So again, Judges 2.10, also all that generation were gathered under their fathers and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord. They didn't even know God, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. They grew up in a land that was conquered. They grew up living in the cities that they had gained from the Canaanites. They grew up with land and inheritance and, and they didn't fight battles. They didn't fight wars. And the sad thing is the Bible says two things of them. They did not know the Lord. I don't know if they knew that there was a God and it is, they, they referred to him as Jehovah God. The Bible says they just didn't know God. And they didn't know anything about the works of God. Apparently, their parents dropped the ball and didn't tell them about Egypt and didn't tell them about the wilderness and didn't tell them about Jericho. Their children, their, their parents just handed everything over to them without giving them a spiritual inheritance. Well, they got land and they got houses and they got cities and they got all of that, but they had no spiritual inheritance. And this generation arose and they were the generation that was going to spend 450 years in an endless cycle of running away from God, worshiping the most abomination of idols you can even imagine because their fathers failed to hand over to them a spiritual heritage. The Bible said that part of the ministry of John the Baptist was going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Those of us in my generation, those of you who are raising your children now, provide for them a good home, provide for them security, do the best you can. That's what we as parents do. But if you do not provide for them a spiritual inheritance, you failed as a dad, you failed as a mom. You, just a, a few months ago, missionary Aaron McCullough was with us. And he told us that one of the greatest detriments to the work of missions are churches and parents. Because churches don't want to give up their best workers and send them off to the mission field. And parents don't want their children going off to some third world country to serve Christ. That is a sad testimony to our generation, folks. We cannot allow that to be a reality. Years and years and years ago, there was a teenager from our youth group, graduated from high school, and wanted to go off to Bible college, wanted to serve God, and uh, her parents were adamantly against it. They did not want their child going into the ministry. These were people three times a week, people in church. Dad was a deacon. Uh, they'd been in the church since the early days. In fact, I think they were there on the first Sunday when that church started. They'd been there for years and years and years. They talked their child out of Bible college, out of surrendering to the Lord. Now, not every kid's going to go to Bible college. I, I'm not saying that. I've never said that. But here's the case where somebody felt led in that direction. It was the parents that talked their child out of it. That girl married an unsaved guy has been out of church for years. If I look on Facebook, and I'm friends with this individual on Facebook uh, and so forth, when there are pictures of family gatherings, you'll see all of them with beer cans in their hands. This girl raised in church. This girl's dad was a deacon. But somewhere along the line, they decided, we don't want our child in the ministry because we don't want them to maybe go off to the mission field and be too far from us or go to the other end of the country serving the Lord in a church somewhere. And this is before the days of cell phones and, and Skype and, and, and all the other ways we have to communicate now. And it was the parents who told their child, you don't want to follow the Lord like that. And the results have been heartbreakingly disastrous. We cannot be that way. The ministry of John the Baptist was to take the generation of his day and get these fathers to wake up and say, you need to become spiritual leaders who are, are investing in your children and pointing your children to the Lord. Second part of his ministry in verse number six, he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Every generation has the temptation to reinvent the wheel. Every generation of kids that grow up, 
they, they tend to, especially as they hit teenage years, to think that their parents just don't know what's really going on. Their parents are just kind of dumb. Was any, were any of my generation like that when we, we grew up? And it's amazing as we hit our 20s and 30s, we realize just how smart mom and dad were after all. And, and I realize, you know, we're living in a changing world. And if I have a problem with my phone, I have to hand it to Tim. Um, something, one of the, the icons on my phone just disappeared one time and I, I had no idea how to find it. I think it was my contacts or something like that. And I don't know what happened to it. So I handed it to him and like 30 seconds later, he hands it back and it's, it's there. And I still don't know what he did. Uh, so I realized, you know, uh, the kids growing up today, they are more computer savvy and tech savvy than, than my generation happens to be. But it, it's, it's bigger than that. We, we sometimes tend to think that our folks are just way too old fashioned and they don't know what they're talking about uh, and so forth. And it's easy for the young generation to cast aside the faith of the previous generation. We've got to water it down, and, and we've got to change things. And that's why churches are, are, are beginning to resemble nightclubs far more than the house of God. Because we just decided the faith of our fathers really wasn't all that important, uh, and so forth. And one of the, the, the messages of John the Baptist is to turn children, the heart of the children to their fathers to realize mom and dad knew what they were talking about. My mom and dad knew God. My mom and dad walked with God. My mom and dad loved God. Brother Harry Reemers went home to be with the Lord today. Um, he was a man who had his heart turned to his children. If you knew him, he, he truly did. Um, he, spent, he and his wife spent their lifetime rearing children that loved the Lord. And if, if uh, of all the Reemers' children that I've met, uh, they embraced the faith of their father and mother. They didn't cast it aside. They didn't act like my parents are, are, are stupid. My parents don't know what they're talking about. Uh, they embraced that. Um, and, and we know Tim and Lynn. They're not here. And, and, and so I'm, I'm, I, I feel a little more at liberty uh, to talk about this without embarrassing them. Uh, but Tim and Lynn have loved the Lord. And they've in turn uh, transferred that to their children. And, and Hannah and Andrew uh, and, and Jonathan, I would hire any and all of them in a heartbeat. Uh, if we had the opportunity to do so. Um, and what you see is fathers who turned their hearts to the children and said the things of God are more important than the size of our house and the name brand tag on the back of their clothing. And they invested that and instilled that in their children. But it is also the children who said, we're going to embrace the, the, the faith of our fathers. Because see, every generation has to make that choice for themselves. I know because of the weather, we don't have as many people here tonight, but we've got young people scattered throughout here. Uh, we've got little children over in the other building. We've got teenagers in here uh, and, and elementary kids in here um, and, and college age kids in here. Would you understand that it's not enough that your parents have tried to put you in a Christian environment, raise you in a Christian home. At some point, you've got to choose for yourself, is this going to be mine? Am I going to follow the Lord uh, of my own free will and choosing. No one can get saved for you. Nobody can surrender to Christ for you. You have to choose it for yourself. And you can decide, I'm going to go out and do my own thing. And sadly, many that grow up in church m make that tragic mistake. Um, but the, the ministry of John the Baptist was to change that and say, hey, young people, listen to what your parents are telling you. Listen to the truth of God. Embrace it to yourself. And so you got the fathers getting a revival saying, I need to give my kids a heritage, a spiritual heritage for God. I'm going to pray for my kids. I'm going to fast for my kids. I'm going to teach them the Bible when I rise up and when I sit down. We're going to talk about the word of God as we walk by the wayside. But it's also children that say, I'm going to listen to what my parents had to say about the things of God so that there is not a generation that arises that knows not the Lord nor the works of the Lord. God forbid that that should happen in our independent fundamental Baptist churches of today. John the Baptist had that ministry of turning uh, these two generations towards each other, but as they did, they were all focusing upward to the things of God. 
with this in set in mind, would you turn to the book of Genesis for a moment? Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. This is the antithesis of what I've been preaching tonight. This is about two generations where the, the heart of the father was not to the children and the heart of the children was not to the father when it came to spiritual things. Genesis 19 revolves entirely around a man named Lot. Now, before we look at this text, I want to read to you from the New Testament what the Bible says of Lot. He was Abram's nephew. Um, and and uh, he had made some choices in his life early on. He chose to live near Sodom. And, and then he chose to live in Sodom, a city that was known for its wickedness. The sin of Sodom is still today called sodomy. Homosexuality was rampant in that ancient city. Yet the Bible says of Lot in 2 Peter chapter 2, and I should turn there so I can read it to you, uh, as the Bible references him in 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, the Bible says uh, in verse 6, in turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that should after live ungodly and delivered just lot. That word just means saved, means righteous lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. This is just almost one of the most unusual uh, uh, descriptions of an individual. Lot chose to live in Sodom. Nobody forced him to be there. He wanted the wealth of Sodom. In the ancient world, Sodom and Gomorrah were right smack dab in the center of the trade routes from Egypt to the uh, Assyrian Babylonian type empires that were growing in those days. So because all the trade routes went through there, these two cities became extremely wealthy uh, and, and had all of that. They were in a lush area, uh, the well-watered plains of Jordan. Lot chose to live there. Nobody forced him to live in that city. He chose that in spite of all the sin that went on. Uh, again, let me read to you. The Bible says that righteous man, so there's no evidence that, that Lot engaged in the sinfulness of Sodom. He just chose to place himself there. He accepted what they did because that's how he could get wealth. He, he gained some prestige and, and position in that city. That righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing. He saw all this wickedness around him, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with her unlawful deeds. On the inside... It just bothered him, the wickedness that he saw displayed, but he chose to keep his family there. He chose to let his, his family be exposed to that, and it bothered him. Uh, but he did nothing about it. He did nothing about it. Well, in chapter 19 of Genesis, if you're there, there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. That means he had a position of judgment and authority in the city. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. He bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house and tarry all night and wash your feet and ye shall rise up early and go on your ways. He didn't know they were angels yet. He didn't know why they had come yet. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly and they turned in unto him and entered into his house and he made them a feast and did bake un unleavened bread and they did eat. So he knew it wasn't safe out in the streets for them at night. So he finally got them into his house. But before they laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. They weren't saying, we just want to meet them. We want to get their autograph. It, it was an, an immoral thing they wanted. And, and I'm being cautious tonight because we have a mixed multitude in this room. 
Uh, these, were, these were the homosexual men of the city, and they wanted those men out that they might do wrong things to them. Uh, and Lot uh, absolutely would not. Um, Lot was so twisted in his values. Uh, verse 7, he said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your, your, your eyes. He's offering his daughter, saying, I'll, I'll send my, my unmarried, pure daughters out to you, and you do whatever you want with them. How would you have liked to have been his daughters? This man's lost his, his moorings entirely, entirely. Uh, he, he's not even understanding right from wrong anymore. And, and of, of, uh, the, the angels, verse 9, said, stand back. Uh, or or the, the men outside, stand back. They said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn. You just came to visit, and now you want to be a judge. And so they're going to go after Lot. The men pull Lot back into the house with them and shut the door and smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou any here besides son-in-law, thy sons, thy daughters, Whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place because of the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. Stop right there in verse 14. Lot is finally, finally getting on the ball and warning his kids of their spiritual danger. Finally, they're grown. Even his youngest daughters are grown. He's got married daughters. He's got married sons. It appears that he may have some unmarried sons. They're grown. They grew up in his home. He's the nephew of Abraham, the father of the faithful. And, and, and we know from Peter that Lot's a saved man. Lot knows truth. Lot knows the truth of God. He's, he's got a righteous soul. Uh, he's been bothered by all the wickedness about him, but he's never taught his kids a thing, nothing at all. Finally, he, he wakes up and he is trying to point his kids to the Lord. Look at the end of verse 14. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. He had spent so little time talking to them about anything spiritual that when he finally did, they thought they just took it as a joke. They laughed at him. He was a joke to them. And you know the rest of the story. Uh, all of his sons and all of his sons-in-law, all of his married daughters died in the, in the destruction of Sodom. And even the two unmarried girls that he was willing to give up, uh, as I said recently, he took them out of Sodom, but he never got Sodom out of them. And they became... Uh, the mothers of two illegitimate children by their own dad who became the founders of two pagan nations that God would eventually have to destroy. That is the exact opposite of what John the Baptist's ministry was all about. John's ministry was to prevent that from happening, saying, hey, you fathers, my job is to help you wake up and realize you better give your children a walk with God. You better transfer faith to them. You better get more concerned about where your children are spiritually than where they are economically, educationally, or anything else. You need to point them to Christ. That's the only thing that matters. And hey, you kids, listen to your mom and dad. You need to embrace the faith of your fathers. We cannot have another generation that rises up and does not know the Lord nor the, yet the works of the Lord. And that's the ministry of John the Baptist. Now in Luke chapter 1, and I'm almost done, the, the angel Gabriel added to that. He is not twisting scripture. Remember, he's the messenger of the Lord. He has some more to put to there from God to Zacharias in verse 17. He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and here it is, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. He's here to call backsliders back to God. He's here to call the worldly back to holiness. He's here to call those who are doing their own thing, who are doing that which is right in their own eyes, back to the wisdom of the just. And the wisdom of the just is found in this book right here. Uh, in Galatians chapter 5, the Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. 
and the Spirit, that's capital S, the Holy Spirit against the flesh, these are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. No man can serve two masters. He will either love the one and hate the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. John's, John's call was to say, look, you need to get right with God. You need to line up with the scripture. You need to get the sin out of your life. You need to stop compromising. You need to stop letting the things of the world influence how you think and how you live and how you sing and how you dress and how you act. And you need to become a holy people in the eyes of God. Ephesians 5, uh, Galatians chapter 5, repeat that theme over and over again that we're supposed to lay some wicked things aside and we're supposed to clothe ourselves with the righteousness of God in every area. Why is that important? Verse 17, the end, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The idea is that when we've taken heed to the message that John the Baptist was sent to proclaim, we will be in a spiritual place, a spiritual state where God can truly meet with us, where God can talk to us, where God can bless us, where God can use us. In some places, that's called revival. And if there's ever been a time in, in human history where there's, there's the need of a revival, it's now. It's now. We, we got to get over our lukewarm mentality of uh, I, I, I came to church and, and, and I've done my thing and get on fire for God and get real about God. Moms and dads, we have got to be more vigilant than ever. Our kids are under attacks that you and I never even dreamed of, you and I never dealt with. Um, when, when I was a kid, the phone hung on the wall. We had a party line. Meaning if I picked it up, I might hear the neighbors talking on the phone. And as a kid, sometimes I'd want to know what's going on, but they always knew, hey, whoever you are, get off the line. And I'd hang it up real fast. I didn't have a cell phone or a smartphone that gave me access to a billion pornographic websites. Didn't have that, but our kids do and our grandkids do. We better be preparing them spiritually and doing more than giving them technology and, and, and giving them all these things. We better be giving them God. That ought to become the, the burden of our hearts. That ought to be the subject of our prayer meetings. That ought to be keeping us awake at night. Oh God, do my kids know you? Do my kids love you? Are my kids following you? And when they're walking away and when they're, they're drifting away, we need to be sensitive to that. Oh God, get a hold of my son. God, get a hold of my daughter. It needs to become the number one all-consuming burden of our hearts and lives. Rather than, yeah, my kid's got a job. He's making six figures a year. Is he in church? Is he walking with God? Is he winning souls? Is he serving in the church, Sunday school teacher, a junior church worker? Is he, is he working on a bus route? Do you understand that working on a bus route, when I got saved, that's what the teenagers of our church did. Our church had six buses bringing in two to 300 kids a week on buses. Three out of, the, I'm sorry, four out of the six bus routes were completely run by teenagers. The only adult in the bus was the driver. It was all teenagers bringing in 40, 50, 60 kids on, on buses on Sunday. And now you can get, barely get teenagers even to come to Sunday school. There's, we're at a day where we need the hearts of the fathers turned to the children and the children to embrace the faith of the fathers and as God's people to decide we're going to be a holy people. We're going to get rid of our sin and get right with God so God can meet with us and bless us and use us in our generation lest we become that generation that breeds a generation that doesn't know anything about God. Can we bow our heads for prayer? Father, thank you for the word of God. John's ministry was not an easy one. He was not an easy preacher. He was a rough one. When certain groups came to him, he referred to them as a generation of vipers. He preached without apology, repent, get things right with God. He fulfilled the ministry that you called him to. Multitudes got right with the Lord, multitudes Probably thousands followed the Lord in believers' baptism. And John pointed them to the Lord Jesus Christ and those multitudes 
many of them stopped following John and began to follow Jesus Christ. John was okay with that because he knew that's what he was called to do. Lord, his message is as much needed today as it was then. A generation of parents and grandparents, adults, who are working with all of their might to bring the next generation into a place where they know God. His message is important to have a generation of young people that embrace the faith of their fathers and make it their own, choose for themselves. The generation of people that choose holiness over worldliness. Lord, I pray that you'd use the message to help us to become a people prepared for the Lord. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I understand our numbers are light because of weather and so forth, but I'm gonna ask you just to stand at your seat. I don't think I have a piano player. That's okay. Oh, you can come, Mrs. Gerb. That'll be fine. Thank you. We're going to have an invitation. We're going to have an invitation. I do not know what part you needed in that. But I believe with all of my heart, if the Lord tarries, we are on the verge of seeing a generation arise that doesn't even know God. I'm talking about church people. We've watered down and changed church. You know, we skip church for everything under the sun, but, buddy, we can't sip, skip soccer practice. And we're, we're missing it. We're missing it. Miss Gerber, would you just start a song of invitation? Anything you want to play will be fine. You can play a Christmas carol. I don't care. Just something. And if God spoke to your heart tonight, there's something you're supposed to do. Let's use an altar. Praise your seat, however you feel fit. The hearts of the fathers to the children. The children to the father. Oh, what a great song, Faith of Our Fathers and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Well, Terry, as folks pray at the altar, at the seat, I don't want to be guilty like that generation in Judges that saw all that God did of failing to prepare the next generation to see God do even greater things. Moms and dads, may it be the burden of your heart that your kids know God, that they know him in such a way that they can do greater things for God than even you've seen. Young people, Take to heart the faith of your fathers, what your teachers, Sunday school teachers and so forth are trying to share with you. Church, let's, let's yield to the spirit of God. Stay away from the works of the flesh. Yield to God. Father, I love you and I thank you. I realize that on a night like this, these are the core people of the church. These are the people that came out when there was a bit of snow on the roads and they would be here no matter what. Yet we need to hear this truth. So many things are battling for our time and attention today. And, and if anybody is gonna, gonna be a people prepared for the Lord, it has to be us. Help us to remember the message today. Lord, in a moment, we'll be dismissed and we'll go home. And I don't know what the weather is doing, but please help us to be careful in the parking lot, getting to and from our car. Keep us safe, uh, protect us, and help everyone get home safe and sound tonight. Bless the week to come. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. If you'll be seated for one second, uh, very, very quickly, don't forget, uh, Wednesday night, Brother Jason Garner is going to be here. You want to be in your place. He's a great preacher. Uh, pray for our teenagers this week. We've got a great week planned for them Monday through Thursday with Brother Garner uh, and, the, and the revival. Those that are homeschooling, uh, you are invited to come in at 8 o'clock every morning for chapel, or I'm sorry, 8.15 for chapel. Uh, what time is the afternoon service? 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So Monday through Thursday, that'll take place. And Friday, that'll also take place. So uh, again, our homeschoolers, if you're here or watching via the live stream, you are invited to bring your, uh, your teenagers in, and we hope you will uh, be uh, able to do that. Invitations are out in the Lord's Supper. Mrs. Clack, they're almost all gone, which is a good thing. Uh, grab some of these, invite coworkers, family, and friends to our Christmas services that start next Sunday. 
It is, it is coming on us rapidly, and uh, please be in your place uh, for those things. There will be a very, very, very brief choir practice tonight. Uh, as church is done, I know choir is going to... There's going to be a brief quartet practice, uh, but the, uh, Brother Rob will meet with you and get you out here quickly. Brother Tim, we do need to tear down, right? So both of us men, if we can help uh, tear things down tonight uh, because of the weather, uh, the school will be inside tomorrow. We sure would appreciate that. And I think that's all the, annu the announcements tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Uh, I believe God met with us. Uh, I was encouraged by even some things I preach. Sometimes God gets a hold of me. I love the music, love seeing you. Thank you for being good sports and moving. Uh, after I got here, I realized, wow, it's weird. There's nobody sitting over here. I can't be satisfied no matter what I do. God bless you. You are dismissed.